It is five years since her funeral, but Jar recognises her face at once. She is standing on the up escalator. He is descending, late again for work after another night out on the wrong side of town. Both escalators are crowded, but he feels that they have the underground to themselves, passing each other as if they are the last two people on earth. Jar's first impulse is to call out to Rosa, hear her name above the din of rush hour. But he freezes, unable to say or do anything, staring at her drift up to the surface of London. Where is she going? Where has she been? His heart rate picks up, palm moistening on the black rubber handrail. Again he tries to call out, but a name sticks in his throat. She looks distracted, anxious, out of sorts. The stowaway hair has gone, replaced by a shaved head. At odds with his memory of her, and her posture is less upright than he remembers, weighed down by an old rucksack with a floral pattern tent bag hanging down. Her clothes too. Baggy Alibaba trousers, fleece, are dishevelled, unchosen. But he knew her shadow on a furze bush, teal blue eyes dancing beneath a serious brow, and those pursed, mischievous lips. She glances down the escalator, searching for someone perhaps, and steps into the flow of passing commuters. Jar scans the people below as a sheet of newspaper slides past him in a warm blast of wind, twisting and folding in on itself. Two men are pushing through the crowds, moving people aside with quiet confidence of authority. Behind them a row of digital adverts flip like playing cards. Frustrated Jar looks to either side of a knot of tourists blocking his way, as if this might somehow disperse them. Don't their London guidebooks explain about standing on the right? He checks himself, remembering his own first hesitant days in town, fresh off the plane from Dublin. And then he is free, skidding around the bottom of the escalators like a child before making his way back up again, opting for the central flight of steps two at a time. Rosa, he calls out, approaching the barriers. Rosa! but there is no conviction in his voice. Not enough belief for anyone to turn round. Five years is a long time to keep the faith. He scours the crowded ticket hall and guesses that she has turned left for the main concourse into Paddington. Paddington. A few minutes earlier, more broke than he should be a week before payday, he had slipped through the barriers behind an unsuspecting commuter. Now he must do the same again. Tailgating an elderly man. He takes no satisfaction from this, no pleasure from the ease with which he avoids detection as he shows the man where to put his ticket and steps through the barrier with him. Deceit masked as the kindness of youth. He runs until he's at the centre of the concourse where he stops for breath, hands on knees beneath the high arching span of Brunel's austere station. Where is she? And then he spots her again heading towards platform one where the Penzance train is preparing to leave. He zigzags through the crowds, cursing, apologising, trying to keep her rucksack in sight. As he spins around the corner of a booth selling greeting cards, he sees her up ahead, beside the first-class carriages of the train, glancing over her shoulder. They used to slip cards brought from shops like this under each other's college room doors, trying to press, the, uh, press with student irony. Instinctively, he turns round, too. Two men are walking towards them, one with a finger to his ear. Jar looks back at the platform. A guard blows her whistle, ordering Rosa to stand aside. Rosa ignores the shrill warning, swings open the heavy door and shuts it behind her with a finality that reverberates around the station. Now it's his turn to approach the tame train. Stand away, the guard shouts again, as the carriages start to move. He runs to the door, but she is already walking down the aisle looking for a space, apologising as she knocks against someone's seat. Keeping parallel with the accelerating train, train, he watches her place, the rack sack in a rack above her, and sit down by the window. For the first time, she seems to be aware of someone beyond the glass, but she ignores him as she settles down, picking up a discarded newspaper, glancing at the luggage rack. The train is moving too fast for him now, but as he runs, Jar smacks his hand against the window. She looks up, wide-eyed with alarm. Is it Rosa? He can't be sure anymore. There's no flicker of recognition. 
no acknowledgement that she knows him, that they were once the loves of each other's lives. He falters slowly to a walk and stops, watching the train pull away as she stares back at him, one stranger to another. Hello Booktube, that was chapter one from J.S. Monroe's Find Me. Now, um, this book is published by Head of Zeus and I'm taking part in the blog tour so I thought I would do a little bit of video telling you what I thought about this book. So basically there are the stories are told in two sections. You've got Jar's story which is the present day and you've got Rose's side of the story which is told in diary form and leads up to her alleged death. Jar does not believe that she committed suicide. She did suffer from depression and her father had recently been killed in a car accident and he worked for the Foreign Office. She disappears one night in Cromer. She had walked to the end of the pier and the CCTV cameras picked her up walking onto the pier but it didn't pick her up coming back. Um, and a note was found purported to be a suicide note. But ever since then, Jar has seen her all over the place. But is it her or is he just hallucinating? So this is the premise of the story and it goes on and the premise of the story is that she has been actually recruited by something like MI5, MA6, CIA, one of those government departments because she's so depressed she doesn't want to live her life she wants to be somebody else so they say they fake their suicides and they can go away and become something completely different or is it? I don't really want to give this away, but I found this was a very fast-paced thriller. I found it hard to put down. The characters are really good. You've got a really, really slimy cop who you think is going to be bad. You've got her Rosa's aunt and uncle um, who are trying to allegedly trying to help Jar get over it. You've got Jar's friends who are helping him, helping him trying to find out what happened, but also encouraging him to seek um, psychiatric help and grief counselling because he won't do it because he doesn't believe that Rose is dead and then you've got these two characters who are straight out of you know the government they seem like they're government employees who are trying to allegedly track down Rosa because she escapes but all is not as it seems and this book has two parts to it there's part one and part two and they're all in this book and part one is the bit um from Jar and Rosa's point of view so Jar in the present day and Rosa in her diary and part two it changes slightly and we have it from Jar's point of view, Rosa's point of view and another character's point of view but I'm not going to tell you who that is because I don't want to spoil it for you. There is a twist in this and I wasn't expecting it, it's a shocking twist but unlike most shocking twists it doesn't happen like that, it's not a quick turnaround, it's a very gradual turnaround so in the second half you start actually learning what actually happened to Rosa and the truth is actually more shocking because it's gradually re revealed what happened rather than if it was just a sudden twist and to me it's more horrifying that way it's more heartbreaking that way and at the end J.S. Monroe doesn't make everything go away and be fine and they're over it and they're getting on with their life he makes it real he makes it so that, yes, they've got over this ordeal. Jar is over this ordeal and Rosa's over this ordeal. So, you know, they're over the ordeal, the physical ordeal. But he does make a point of saying that the emotional ordeal, the emotional scars of what happened in those five years are going to affect that person for a very long time. And you are one left wondering, will they make it? Will Jar and Rosa make it? She, you know, Rosa before this happened to her wasn't a very strong person. Well, she was a strong person, but she was a very depressed person. She'd lost her mum, she'd lost her dad, and she was very depressed and suicidal at points. And then this happened to her and she survived it. And that makes her extremely strong. But you just wonder, will she mentally be strong enough? Now she's free to carry on. And it is one of those books, and they don't happen very often, where they actually leave you wondering what will happen to the characters after. And it's very, very rare to find a book that does that. And I really, really enjoyed this book. Um, so this is published by Head of Zeus. And it is 
was so cleverly done. The twists and turns are cleverly written, the ideas are cleverly done, the conspiracies are brilliant and the twist is absolutely fantastic. You can't go wrong, if you pick up one thriller this year this is going to be the one I would recommend it. I mean there's been some good thrillers this year, this isn't the first brilliant thriller I've read but I would definitely recommend if you like a good thriller do pick this up. Now I gave this four out of five stars um, mainly because the nothing really jarred with it at all but I think it was just too horrific for me to give it five stars that I just couldn't you know it got to the point where I didn't want to know what was going to happen next and but it's still well worth the read and I would definitely definitely recommend that you pick this up and give it a read so that's Find Me by J.S. Munro pick it up if you want to and I will see you soon that's my recommendation for the month and I will see you very soon booktube Hope you're having a good reading time. Bye-bye now.